Thanks for joining everyone. We're just gonna give it about one or two more minutes and then we'll get started. Thanks for your patience. All right, it is now 6.01, so I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining everyone. Um, this is the Oregon's Turtles webcast. My name is Allie Fisher, and I'll be your MC for tonight. I'm the Wildlife and Equity Diversity and Inclusion Associate for Oregon Wild. I'm really honored to introduce our guest tonight. Lori Holtz is an ecologist for the city of Eugene, and will speak tonight about freshwater turtles and efforts to restore their habitat. Dr. Selena Heppel is the Department Head of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Sciences at Oregon State University. We'll be taking a deep dive into Oregon sea turtles. I would also like to offer gratitude to the land itself tonight and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. I'd also like to acknowledge the continuing presence of indigenous peoples on the land today. The history of tribes in Oregon is really complex and nuanced and includes colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forced removal that have long lasting and current impacts. It's really important to not only acknowledge indigenous peoples and the land, but continue to do meaningful work by supporting them in the present, respecting and uplifting tribal sovereignty during your research and taking action. Additionally, a recording of this program will be emailed out this week and will be posted on our website, OregonWild.org, in the WILD blog. Please enter your questions at any time in the Q&A section. We normally get a flood of questions towards the end, so the sooner you can get yours in, the easier it will be for me to organize and ask them after our guests have finished presenting. The raffle will also still be open after the presentation, so if you want to snag some of these items, make sure to check that out. Lastly, make sure to sign up for our next webinar about protecting old growth forests for climate justice. Now I'll hand it off to our first presenter, Lori Holt. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you, Allie, for that introduction, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I'm just going to jump right in because I have a lot of information to share. In Oregon, we have um, only two native uh, species, the um, northwestern pond turtle and the western painted turtle. The northwestern pond turtle, as shown on your left, is an olive brown kind of drab turtle. Um, with some light colored on the head. Um, this particular one is a female. Um, they often have yellow with spots and the males might have a light yellow throat with no spotting. 
The Western painted turtle is a um, much more colorful turtle with yellow stripes um, and patterns on the head and legs and red coloration on the plastron, which is the lower shell, as well as on the edge of the carapace or the upper shell. I'm not going to go into some of the um, non-native invasives that we have in Oregon, but we, um, I wanted to mention uh, the most common one, and that's the red-eared slider, um, mostly because it is similar in coloration to the western painted turtle. Um, so you can see it's very colorful with yellow on, um, on its shell and yellow stripes on its head and um, uh, legs, um, but it has this more prominent red stripe, hence its name, on its head um, near where its ear would be. Um, so from the top to bottom, we have the Northwestern Pond Turtle with its planar coloration, a little bit of yellow, light yellow on the shell, the um, red-eared slider, the introduced turtle species, and then the Western Painted Turtle on the bottom. Now these are all um, younger turtles um, that are shown here in this photo and they are more colorful when they're younger. So um, they can lose that coloration as they age and um, they become darker. So sometimes, especially from a distance, they can be much harder to tell apart than this photo. So you may have heard um, the Northwestern Pond Turtle called the Western Pond Turtle. And um, that's because in more recent years, um, they have been separated into two different species the Northwestern Pond Turtle and the Southwestern Pond Turtle. The Northwestern is considered to go um, be from Central California up into Washington. And then the Southwestern Pond Turtle is um, from Central California down into uh, Baja, California. In, um, in Oregon, uh, the Northwestern Pond Turtle Hold on one second, I apologize. And a little, a, a pup that's <laughs> playing. Um, so the Northwestern Pond Turtle is considered a sensitive um, species in Oregon, and it is um, also on the Oregon Conservation Strategy Species list. Um, it's also considered vulnerable in California and it's endangered in Washington. The Western Painted Turtle is a subspecies of the Painted Turtle, which is widespread globally and widespread in the United States. But note on the map here that it, um, its population extends, um, it doesn't extend very far in Oregon, and it's primarily found in the Willamette Valley and in our more urban areas. And for those reasons, it's um, considered also considered an Oregon state sensitive species and an Oregon conservation strategy species. But it's not um, considered, it doesn't have any um, status or uh, for um, consideration in any of the other states. Quick life history, both these species are very similar. They're very long lived. You can tell um, the age of uh, younger turtles that are less than you know eight or ten by counting the annuli on the plastron, that's the lower shell. Like trees, they grow more quickly um, during the warmer months and more slowly um, during the winter, so that puts down a pattern on their shell. They also grow more quickly when they're younger and as they age, um, they grow more slowly and so the patterns get closer and closer, closer together. Also with older turtles, um, not only do the lines get closer, but the plastrons get smoothed out with time and it can make it really hard to um, age a turtle. They're highly um, opportunistic omnivores. They feed on lots of little critters, um, carrion. They're really good um, eaters of, of dead fish and so on. And they, um, they eat various aquatic plants. They take a long time to mature. Um, and so uh, that can really be detrimental to their population because they're not uh, producing a, a lot of young for, um, and, and they don't produce until later in life. Courtship occurs in early spring and then nesting is primarily in June with a little bit of time on either side. So 
So their habitat needs um, are uh, vary with their life stage. Um, most of the life stages use obviously aquatic uh, habitat, and that includes all aquatic vegetation, um, and they need basking structures. They also, um, the, the aquatic vegetation provides cover as well as food. Um, but turtles also do need uh, terrestrial land, landscapes and habitats. So um, this diagram isn't the best in terms of um, highlighting some of the upper or the um, habitat that they need for uh, nesting, um, but I'll show that in a, my next slide. Um, but northwestern pond turtles in particular will overwinter in upland areas and they burrow under the leaf litter or duff. Um, and that's particularly the case when um, they're in a river system. Um, in a pond system, they tend to burrow down in the winter uh, in the mud and muck at the bottom of a pond. Painted turtles are a little less likely to come out and um, overwinter on land. So here's a better image of uh, really good um, turtle nesting habitat. Uh, so it has very low, veg little vegetation and a lot of kind of bare, bare soil. And that's because the eggs need to incubate in full sun. Uh, females will come up again, that's typically in June. Um, they find a good spot, they urinate, and then let that soak in. Then they begin digging using their back legs, dig uh, a hole down about six to eight inches deep, and they lay uh, between six to 10 eggs, and both species are pretty similar in, in Oregon. Um, they take the material that they dug out and scoop it back in with their back legs and cover it back up, kind of like a mud patty. And they'll also scoop some dried grass and moss and whatever other vegetation they can reach with their back legs. And um, once that dries out, it's really difficult to see. This photo in the bottom center is a turtle nest that most people would just walk by. And, and often they're not even um, that visible. So uh, turtles, uh, the Northwestern pond turtle and painted turtles have about a 90 day incubation period. And the, so they hatch out of their eggs usually sometime in September. However, um, they generally stay in underground in that nest um, through until the spring. So March, late March and early April. Um, occasionally there's fall emergence, but um, typically, they're going to overwinter. They're really not doing much in there, and they're living off their yolk sac. Um, and then once spring comes, they dig their way back out. You can see the little nest opening here that these little guys came out. There haven't been a lot of studies on uh, juvenile or early hatchling life, but they appear um, to stay close to the nest and on land for um, a couple of weeks and they may even go back in to the chamber if it gets extra cold. These little guys are about the size of a quarter or uh, maybe a half dollar and they are super vulnerable. So both um, nest, the nesting habitat is one of the most critical uh, habitat types for turtles and also one of the ones that you don't always see in um, adjacent to ponds and waterways where we have turtles and that's because humans also like to be near water and we like to you know um, put in farms agriculture uh, build roads and paths and you know all the development that we do so that's one of the biggest threats to turtle nesting is that um, we have significantly impacted their habitat um, Additionally, uh, for the nest as well as the hatchlings, uh, we have quite a number of what we call meso predators in our urban and suburban areas that are very cued into looking for and eating um, the eggs in particular, but they'll also eat uh, the hatchlings. So raccoons, skunks are, are two of the ones that we have a uh, problem with here in Eugene. 
So juveniles um, are considered age one to three, and remember age one is shortly after they've um, left the nest in the spring um, because, or, you know, probably when they enter the water. Um, and, and then till age three, that's a period when they're growing very quickly. Their habitat needs are often um, not considered when doing restoration work for turtles, um, partly because not a lot is known, but they, uh, they live in the near shore, um, closer to shore, and they um, need a lot of cover and vegetation. Um, so emergent vegetation, aquatic vegetation, and then smaller woody structures or places where they can get out onto a small branch um, as compared to like a large log. They're still very vulnerable to predators, um, but we see a lot more heron, um, those beautiful great blue heron and, and green herons are probably one of the biggest predators for the, these little guys. And then subadults, which are the pre-reproductive um, turtles and adult turtles, um, spend a lot of their time in the water but pond turtles in particular um, can spend quite a bit of time on land as mentioned overwintering or sometimes if a waterway dries up they will come out on land and wait for wait for the rains um, they depend heavily on basking um, obviously they're reptiles and so for their metabolism and also to um, process calcium and some of the other functions that are needed, especially um, during reproductive season. So with the, the rest of the time that I've left, I wanna highlight a little bit of work that we've been doing at a site in uh, Northwest Eugene, it's called Golden Gardens. Um, uh, this is a site that's, um, it's a former gravel extraction pond, like many of our ponds in the Willamette Valley. And um, we have been doing work there since 2009 and 10. Uh, there are about 50 to 60 Northwestern pond turtles present. And um, we've been working in partnership with uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, Chris Yee is our, the local district biologist that I work with. Um, we began you know, trying to learn more about the turtle population there, trapping them, um, doing surveys and really observed that we primarily had adult turtles there. Uh, the juveniles and the subadults can be really hard to find because they're in those shallow waters and they're not necessarily out basking. But we did uh, use some trapping methods to try to see if we could find the younger um, turtles and we really uh, weren't finding any. We also um, started doing nest searches in 2014 because this, this is a very, um, quite a large site and it's surrounded by uh, a lot of potential nesting habitat. So we began our annual nest searches and um, really found that the nests were getting dug up by predators um, nearly 100%. We also were able to do some work that I'm gonna mention uh, thanks to a three-year tri-state grant uh, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, as far as improving uh, nesting and juvenile recruitment, here's a map. You don't need to look at the details, but um, this is eight years worth of mapping uh, the nests that we found. The red are red-eared slider nests. We also have a very healthy red-eared slider population at this pond. And then we have the Northwestern Pond Turtle Nest. I did forget to mention um, when talking about the distribution of the painted turtle that they don't, their populations don't extend down into the Eugene, Springfield, or Southern Oregon areas. They're primarily found in Albany area and north, um, although there is a small population at the Mackenzie River in um, Rock uh, property on the Mackenzie River. Um, so we, we don't have painted turtles here. So yellow is all the pond turtles. If any of you have read any of the literature about um, pond turtles, it, it talks, a lot of the literature talks about turtles preferring west facing banks, which would be, you know, the banks on these sides of the ponds, or south facing banks, which would be, you know, the, some of these areas. And our turtles at Golden Gardens don't read the textbooks. So 
they've obviously are selecting this um, this western edge and kind of down here along this this smaller pond and channel. Um, so this was super helpful. It allowed us to to figure out where we needed to focus our efforts. Um, for a number, the first few years, we would go out daily during nesting season and try to find nests. They're really hard to find. Um, and we did not have a whole lot of success. And, and then the predators would come in, you know, overnight and eat the eggs. So it was very frustrating. But because of this careful work we had done, we were also able to figure out an area where we could um, install a more permanent fence that would exclude predators in one of the hotspot areas where the turtles were nesting. Um, here's some images of that, that fence. It um, is about 500 feet long and extends down into the water. And most importantly, it's buried about a foot down to keep skunks from digging under. And it also has a bent, kind of a, a bend at the top to keep raccoons from climbing over. Um, that has been highly successful. Uh, and here's some of our data. So um, that nest fencing went in, the predator fencing went in um, in 2019. And um, so this, this one nest protected was actually, the, the nest was protected in 2018. Um, and so these, we have increasing number of nests that we're able to protect, um, although not all of them are within that fenced area. And then um, these are the number of hatchlings we've been able to recruit into the population over the last four years. It takes a village to raise baby turtles. We have lots of volunteers, lots of help from other organizations, and it's been a great success story. So we've also been enhancing habitat. Um, we have been planting vegetation, emergent vegetation, transplanting aquatic vegetation, and installing um, small woody debris for those juveniles. Um, this is really a habitat type that was missing at this site. We had plenty of nesting and plenty of aquatic habitat, but we the site was really missing this component. And now that we're recruiting all these juveniles, we wanted to make sure that they were set up for success. We really had way too much information to present tonight. And so um, here's some bonus. Um, materials that you can take a look at. In particular, there's a really great YouTube video that was done by a U of O journalism student um, that you can find to it this link. And I believe that Allie's going to send out these links as well. There's also a lot of great work being done all over the state. There's three different um, working turtle groups in, in the state and um, many people working hard to um, help keep Northwestern pond turtles in particular off, hopefully off endangered species list, but we'll see they're being um, considered for listing right now. Um, and with that, I'm likely out of time, <laughs> but I wanted to share my contact information as well in case anybody has any questions um, that aren't answered at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Great. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and get started uh, so we can stay on time today. Hi, everybody. I'm Selena Hapel. I'm the head of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Sciences at OSU. And I'm going to talk to you today about sea turtles. I've been working on sea turtles uh, for about 30 years, I guess. And um, i tell you a little bit about Oregon sea turtles and some. Um, issues about uh, sea turtle conservation worldwide. Get my screen going here and we'll just start with a little nice, uh, a nice little bit of video just because it's always good to take a look at a sea turtle underwater. This is a hawksbill sea turtle uh, in the Cayman Islands. You see he's looking around there. Uh, it could be a girl actually, a juvenile like this. You can't really tell because the males will grow a long tail but not until they're adults. Uh, and this turtle might be eating, uh, looking for sponges to eat uh, because that's one of their primary prey actually is uh, sponges. 
right. Let me move on there. So uh, the sea turtle species that exist in the uh, United States uh, include the loggerhead, green, leatherback, hawksbill, and the two Ridley turtles. So in Oregon, though, we have primarily uh, the ones you, you might see on the beach are the loggerhead, green, uh, leatherback, or olive Ridley turtles. And the most uh, common ones that wash up on our beaches here are the olive Ridley and green turtles. Now, what's interesting about that is, uh, so sea turtles don't nest in Oregon because it's much too cold for them here, um, but they uh, do occasionally get caught in warm water currents and uh, will get uh, end up in uh, kind of stuck in the cold, cooler water of Oregon's near shore. Um, and that puts them into kind of a comatose state. They get uh, hypothermia, basically. And so they slow way down and they end up getting caught in a wave or otherwise and, and uh, washing up onto the beach. Now, when they do that, they're often still alive, not always, but sometimes they are still alive and they can actually be picked up and rehabilitated. The leatherback turtle, on the other hand, is a bit different, and that is the turtle that can actually survive and uh, feed in cool water. And so we do see living leatherbacks uh, feeding off the Oregon coast occasionally. And the leatherback is the largest living turtle, and they are quite something if you happen to be lucky enough to see one. Uh, uh, the weighing up to 650 kilograms or about 1,400 pounds. Now, sea turtles face a lot of different threats, um, including being caught in uh, fishing gear, like fishing lines or nets. Uh, they eat plastics, uh, which they may just uh, think are uh, jellyfish, because jellyfish are a uh, common prey for sea turtles. Uh, they get uh, hit by the oil spills. Uh, so this is a Kemp's Ridley, or sorry, a green turtle that was uh, hit by the um, Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And then, like I was saying, in off our coast here, we sometimes see them because they've hit cold water and they, and they um, end up washing up on the beach. So a lot of people ask me, well, are sea turtles going extinct? And a lot of people think that sea turtles are going extinct. But I'm going to try to convince you otherwise because sea turtles are an amazing success story. Green turtles in Hawaii, substantial increases. Green turtles in Florida also very large increases in population size. And, um, and we see trends like this in sea turtle populations in many parts of the world. That said, there are also species like the leatherback turtle in the Pacific where the population is not doing well. And what's interesting about our leatherbacks is that they actually uh, begin life in Indonesia. So these turtles uh, are born on the other side of the Pacific and then over the course of their lifespans um, and even as adults making a regular migration back and forth, they will go all 7,000 miles across the Pacific. Now these larger leatherback turtles, sub-adult and adult turtles will feed off the west coast of the US. Leatherbacks primarily do eat jellyfish and uh, other jelly-like organisms like salps and so on. And so we will um, sometimes uh, be lucky enough to see them off Oregon, but they're more likely to be seen off Northern California and in other places where there's a lot of uh, egg yolk jellies and other species that uh, they really like to feed on. Now, what's happened with leatherbacks in the Pacific is that we've seen a decline of about 6% per year since uh, the monitoring began. And uh, off the US West Coast, you see that there's um, definitely overall been a, a decline. So we are very concerned about leatherback turtles in the Pacific. But worldwide, we have uh, the analyses that have been done of various populations for which we have long time series, good monitoring data over long time periods, show that all the green dots here are populations of sea turtles of different species that are increasing compared to examples of species that are decreasing. So as it turns out right now, no species of sea turtle is in immediate danger of extinction. 
most species, in fact, have been downlisted from uh, uh, critically endangered to um, crit uh, vulnerable or in danger. Hawaiian green turtles, and some of you may have seen green sea turtles in Hawaii, are an amazing and wonderful example of a success story in a population growth of uh, sea turtles in the world. However, some populations of turtles are in real trouble, including those leatherbacks in the Pacific. When we see um, and ask ourselves, well, why is that? Why, why do we do have these success stories? It's really because of international cooperation, conservation efforts in different parts of the world, and education. So here's a picture that one of my students took of a, a, a researcher being trained in how to collect sea turtle data in Palau. We have folks who have worked with fishermen all over the world to reduce bycatch of sea turtles in different fisheries and teach the fishermen how to release the turtles unharmed. And then we have education efforts like the, uh, this example of sea turtle biology and conservation and ecology being taught to kids in Kenya. And that's resulted in some populations really rebounding. Uh, you can go to Playa de Ostianal in Costa Rica and see the olive ridley turtles there uh, nesting by the tens of thousands. Um, and in fact, there are so many turtles that nest on this particular beach that they dig each other's nests up and uh, a lot of the eggs don't survive. So what the officials there have allowed is for uh, local people to harvest some of those eggs legally um, because it doesn't have an impact on the population and it can um, provide some local income uh, for people who live there. So here's a test for you all, a test. It's not a test, it's not a quiz. It's just to see what you think might be some, the biggest effect on sea turtle populations. Okay, now you notice I put populations in italics there, so that's kind of a hint here. So which human impacts have the biggest effect on sea turtle populations? Bycatch in fisheries, so that's when people who are fishing accidentally catch sea turtles, okay? Plastic straws, some of you may have seen the sea turtle with the plastic straw up its nose, uh, and uh, that, that uh, video went viral okay sea level rise and hurricanes boat strikes egg harvest warmer beach temperatures because remember of course with climate change we have increasing temperatures on beaches and plastic bags okay so think about that and then i'm going to take you through a couple of these and give you what i think the answers are uh based on analyses that we've done uh, here at OSU and at many other universities around the world. So the biggest impact on populations of sea turtles continues to be bycatch in fisheries. So let's figure out why that is. Um, so Lori told you a little bit about some of the different life stages of freshwater turtles. Sea turtles have similar life stages, okay? Uh, start off life as a little cute little hatchling coming out of the nest, digging your way out of the nest with all your brothers and sisters, uh, and uh, heading off uh, down the beach out to the ocean, okay? Uh, then a lot of sea turtles will spend one to 10, up to 10 years out in the open ocean, okay, as a small juvenile. And they might live in uh, sargassum weed like this, uh, they're probably feeding on things like uh, small uh, pelagic crabs and other things that are associated with that sargassum. And then, of course, the jellyfish that uh, would be out there in the middle of the sea. Then most of the species will, the, of the hard shell turtles at least, will come in and live in close, in waters that are closer to shore. Okay. So at that point, they're feed, they feed on things on the bottom. So they're feeding on uh, shellfish, things like crabs, shrimp, um, various snails and other mollusks, 
things like that. Okay. And then they, after another 10 years, in some cases, they would mature and become an adult. And as females would come and nest on land, but as males would not come to land at all. The exception being those green turtles in Hawaii actually do bask just like freshwater turtles do. Uh, but most sea turtles do not do that. And so it's actually very hard to study male sea turtles because they don't come to land um, where we can put tags on them and things like that. Okay, so some of these turtles are taking 20 or 30 years to reach maturity. And then they're living many decades after they uh, start nesting for the first time. So because of that, what it means is let you start off life as this little tiny hatchling, and then it's going to take a really long time. Each one of these turtles represents a year, an age, okay? It's going to take a really long time to get to adulthood. And in this example for loggerheads, it'd be about 22 years, okay? And so there's some probability of dying every year. And what happens is that because of uh, the probability of dying then kind of compounds over time, you end up with a smaller and smaller chance the older you are, you get of still being alive. And what that means is that even if you save a lot of little baby turtles, or even if you have a, a negative impact on a lot of baby turtles, it doesn't necessarily translate into a big impact at the population level because the turtle has so many more years to go before it reaches maturity. And so the way, what, what, uh, what we do with sea turtle evaluations is we create computer models of uh, virtual populations of sea turtles. And then we look at, well, how is the population likely to respond to something that we do in con for conservation or for uh, maybe a new threat to that turtle. And what we do, what we found is that even if all the baby turtles were kept alive to their first birthday, sorry, click too fast, even if all of them were kept alive to their first birthday, then the population would still decline. The solution then to the bycatch and fisheries problem for some is to figure out how to stop catching them. And if you do have to happen to catch them, how to avoid uh, killing them when you catch them so you can actually release them. And so one example of that is the turtle excluder device, which was uh, invented to reduce the kill of sea turtles in shrimp fisheries. And so what happens is that there's this uh, grating that goes in the net, and then the turtle gets caught in the net, but it bumps up against that grate and then gets uh, pushed out and, and kind of uh, uh, shot out the top of the net uh, through a hole that's covered by a flap of the netting. And then that turtle can actually get to the surface and breathe again. And so that's how we protect sea turtles from shrimp trawling. We have other techniques that are used to reduce uh, the catch of sea turtles in line fisheries and in other kinds of net fisheries and so on. So if we apply these turtle excluder devices to that same computer model that showed that the population would decline even if we saved every baby turtle to its first birthday, what we see is that adding the turtle excluder devices actually results in a population that's expected to increase. And that's exactly what we've seen with several sea turtle populations in the US and other places where, sea tur where these turtle excluder devices have been put into play. Now, we see terrible things happen to sea turtles sometimes, like this little baby turtle that got caught in a plastic cup on its way down to the ocean, or this turtle that got hit by a boat and is now in the sea turtle hospital where they've glued its shell back together so that it can survive. And when we see those impacts on those individual animals, our heart goes out to them. And of course, we wanna do everything we can to protect them. But often those impacts on individual turtles do not have a detectable effect at the population level. And so that's the kind of work that I do is, is try to figure out, okay, how is this threat actually affecting whole populations? Doesn't mean that we shouldn't worry about these individuals and we should do what we can to protect them, but 
it's not necessarily going to be the most important thing for saving the whole population of the species. Now, let's go back to our list. Now that I've given you some more information and think about some other threats to sea turtles that might be a really big deal, okay? <laughs> so one thing that's hard to quantify is this issue of plastic bags. So we know there's a lot of plastic in the ocean, a whole lot of plastic in the ocean. And we know that sea turtles eat it. And sometimes they eat it because they mistake it for a jellyfish because a plastic bag looks a lot like a jellyfish. Other times they eat it because they just eat stuff. They see stuff and they eat it. And <laughs> Lori can probably tell you that freshwater turtles kind of do the same thing. They, they, you know, they see something and they, and they get curious about it and they tend to put it in their mouth. Well, the problem with sea turtles is that they have in their throats, they have these downward pointing projections. And what that means, it's, it's a good thing to have those if you eat jellyfish all day because you don't want the jellyfish to squirt out of your mouth or out of your throat after you swallow it. But the problem is that it means that if you swallow something that you don't want to eat, you have no, you can't throw it back up. And that means that anything that they're eating that isn't food is going to have to pass all the way through. And so that's why we see some turtles. Uh, with plastic in their guts when they wash up on the beach. The problem is we don't really have a good way to quantify this because we don't see the dead bodies very often, okay? A sea turtle is much more likely to die far out at sea and then sink, and we never see it, so we don't know what that impact is. It's also very hard to quantify how much plastic is out there. So this is kind of an unknown for us, but we don't. We do know that plastics can have an effect, and we know that they are um, increasing in abundance in the ocean. All right, so let's talk about the la the last one I'm going to discuss today, and that's sea level rise in hurricanes. Okay, so sea level rise is a pretty big factor coming up because beaches are warning warming and hurricanes are more damaging. So sea turtle reproductive success overall is gradually declining in many areas. So even though the survival of those smallest turtles isn't always the thing that's driving the population decline, if you have a steady impact kind of pressure like that and the population, uh, then the population is likely to respond to it and eventually have a real problem. And sea level rise means that we're going to have more efforts to protect property with sea level, uh, sea walls and beach armory. So if you think about it, a big wall like this, the sea turtle's not going to be able to get over that wall. And what that wall is actually going to ultimately do is make most of this beach wash away. Okay. So the sea turtle's not going to have a way to go and nest uh, in its in the habitat where it normally would go. Um, and you got to think about the fact that a sea turtle born today might live to be to the year 2100 <laughs> and think about sea level rise projections and things like that. So the question really becomes, can the turtles adapt if they have nowhere to go? And if you look at a map of the eastern U.S., so there are sandy beaches along in North Carolina and Virginia where sea turtles could potentially move and nest you know, moving northward from Florida. The problem is that we have armoring allowed in many of these states, and that means that ultimately there may not be places for the turtles to nest, even if they do uh, migrate northward um, uh, in response to climate change. Last thing, and this is kind of a fun one uh, to think about, um, for sea turtles and all turtles have what we call temperature dependent sex determination. So warmer temperatures for turtles, warmer temperatures produce females and cooler temperatures produce males. They don't have X and Y chromosomes uh, and it's, uh, the sex of the hatchling is determined um, while it's in the egg, okay, during incubation. So what does this mean if we have warming beach temperatures? Well, we can see that the sex ratios of loggerhead turtles in the United States are already very strongly female biased. And we have years where, as best we can tell, 100% of the hatchlings that were produced on that beach were female. 
at some point, that could be a problem, right? Because the question then becomes, will there be enough males in the future? So at first, we might expect an increase in nests because more females are being produced. But if females can't find a mate, they might skip reproduction and ultimately nest less often. But females don't breed every year, and males often do. So because they live a long time, what we're finding is that if there are good male years every so often, we can keep enough males in the population for there to be enough mating and uh, successful reproduction. So we're still learning a lot about this and thinking about new mitigation efforts and other things to make sure that we have enough male sea turtles out there. Um, volunteers help sea turtles. And there are volunteers who protect nests uh, and move the nests if they're in a bad spot. There are folks that look at the dead turtles on the beaches and gather data for us uh, that's really essential. Uh, for determining uh, where turtles are going and um, how their populations are doing. And then there are folks who rehabilitate turtles in uh, sea turtle hospitals. Here in Oregon, we do have stranded and injured wildlife response for sea turtles. Uh, we get a couple of, yeah, on typically one or two per year. Uh, and the um, Oregon Coast Aquarium is a rescue and rehabilitation center for sea turtles. And they can actually it's, take one of those turtles, even if it looks dead, even if it's very close to death, and very slowly warm it up, uh, and then actually rehabilitate it, get it feeding again, and uh, uh, get it released. Uh, the Seaside Aquarium also is uh, able to do some of this rehabilitation. And here's a, a cold, what they call cold stunned turtle. Um, that has washed ashore in Cannon Beach and they've uh, cordoned off the area to make sure nobody bothers the turtle. And then they will go and pick it up and warm it up slowly and try to get it to a rehabilitation center um, in uh, California in most cases, but Seattle Aquarium also will rehabilitate sea turtles and hopefully get them back out into the wild. So here's some things you can do. Keep the plastics off the beach and don't re release those balloons. <laughs> Call someone if you see a sea turtle on the beach, alive or dead, and support sea turtle conservation and education programs around the world. Thanks very much and watch out for sea turtles. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I've learned so much from both of you in, <laughs> in this presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm Danielle Moser. I'm the Wildlife Program Manager for Oregon Wild. I'm just going to go through like three slides and then we're going to get to questions and answers. So uh, just bear with me and we'll get right to it. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so really appreciate you all being here tonight to learn about Oregon's turtles. And again, thank you to our special guests. I have already learned so much, so really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of an overarching thing that really um, is really important to drive conservation of lots of species in Oregon, but especially uh, freshwater turtles. And that's the, and uh, Lori mentioned it, but the Oregon Conservation Strategy and the Nearshore Strategy. So these are um, wildlife action plans uh, that each state is supposed to have. And it's basically a blueprint for how um, to conserve and protect, you know, uh, many species in the state, especially those that are most vulnerable and imperiled. And the reason we in Oregon have two is because um, ODF and W, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, has jurisdictional boundaries up to three nautical miles. So they are kind, they oversee um, all the species in the in the near shore. I, in, in combination with NOAA and US Fish and Wildlife Service, but that's kind of why they we also have a nearshore strategy. Um, so what does this mean? Why is this important? And why am I bringing this up for a turtle webcast? Um, so again, these are these blueprints. It's a framework for how to protect and restore um, habitat. And, and again, all of these different species that are particularly vulnerable or imperiled. It's either you know, federally listed threatened and endangered species. They are species of greatest conservation needs, species of greatest conservation concern. Um, and so as you can see from this slide in Oregon, there are 294 species uh, that are considered strategy species that are on the list. Um, and they include the Western Pond and Painted Turtles as Lori pointed out. 
Um, and why does this matter? And what, what do we need to be doing about it? So um, this program, this particular effort to, to implement the, all of the recommendations of the Oregon Conservation Strategy have been woefully underfunded for too many years. Um, OPB did a story, I think it was back in 2016, um, and actually they met up with one of the field biologists who was doing some turtle restoration, and this person was one of two um, biologists for ODFNW, and they actually had used plastic water bottles to make shift some device to help with the restoration efforts, um, and it just showcased that you know, even these biologists were using their own resources and things that they could find in their house to do restoration. Um, and the fact that we really need to invest strongly in these programs. Um, and just to give you the numbers, you know, of all the species in Oregon, 88% of them are not hunted or fished and they get about two to 4% of, of the agency's budget. Um, for, for those conservation programs. So you can clearly see a discrepancy in why we need to, to really fully fund this program. Um, and not to mention that uh, not every species on the Oregon Conservation Strategy is a non-game species, but a predominant number of them are. And so that just wanted to, again, highlight those numbers. So what we need to do is expand our funding, diversify our funding sources, and make sure that these biologists and the agency that's tasked with protecting and restoring our fish, wildlife, and habitat have the funds to do it. So there is a proposal in Congress. If you are on Oregon Wild List, you have seen my emails, I am sure, but it's called Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Um, it's being considered by Congress to invest $1.4 billion into wildlife conservation across the country. Um, and specifically for Native American tribes to also have a pot of money to do restoration. And so for Oregon, that could mean $25 million a year um, to implement the Oregon Conservation and Near Shore Strategies. So really important. Um, and again, a big portion of it has to be spent on the restoration of threatened and endangered species, um, you know, wildlife uh, associated recreation projects, education. So a wide range of things that we really desperately need funding for. So final slide, and then we'll get to questions. RAWA, as we call it for shorthand, has passed the full house in Congress and it has passed the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. And it is expected to pass the full Senate. Full Senate. It has bipartisan support. Um, and we think it will pass between the time of the election and when the new, elect, um, new legislators take, take office. So probably sometime in November, but we really need help to make sure that this vote gets scheduled um, and that this, this really goes all the way through. So if you have a minute, I urge you to please call Senators Wyden and Merkley and thank them for their support. They have supported RAWA. Um, Wyden is a co-sponsor and Merkley supported it in committee. Um, but the really important thing to do is to call Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. There's his phone number leave a message, just ask them to pass Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Um, it's what we can do to help Western Pond and Painted Turtles and a number of other species that desperately need the funding. So thank you, that's my pitch today and we'll go into questions. Thanks, Danielle. All right, I'll kick it off with some questions and make sure to put any lingering questions in the Q&A section. I'll try to get to them as best I can. Um, I have a question for you, Lori. Actually, a few questions relating to this, but a lot of folks are wondering what the hatchlings eat in between hatching and emerging months later. Do they eat? What happens there? <laughs> well, they're basically living off their yolk sac. Um, so they're not actively eating. In fact, um, they can't eat on land. They eat only in the water. So they're um, they're down there just, you know, living off that yolk sac. <laughs> and they're not growing a whole lot. They're probably not moving a whole lot as, you know, and, and, and using a lot of energy either until they're getting closer to um, actually digging their way out. And sea turtles spend about 60 days in the sand uh, as hatchlings and also living off their yolk sac. Um, and so then they would come out and, and head off out to sea. Uh, and a lot of them would swim for as hard as they can for about three days, living off that yolk sac reserve and then start feeding. Interesting, thank you. 
Um, I have another question asking if part parthenogenesis is possible for turtles, um, specifically looking at the population numbers where we're having mostly females. Is that anything to consider in the future? So as best I know, these, uh, turtles have not shown parthenogenesis. Um, lizards, some lizards do. Uh, and it is a, a, a point of speculation among uh, biologists of whether turtles that are faced with such skewed sex ratios would actually um, uh, resort, so to speak, to parthenogenesis. We don't know yet. Great, thank you. Um, question for you, Lori, about some of your conservation work. Um, you mentioned there's red-eared turtles at the site as well. Um, are you trying to get rid of them or are you just trying to give pond turtles an edge so they can recover? Well, we're doing a little bit of both. Um, at Golden Gardens, when we um, were trapping um, turtles in general, we were trapping both to um, catch Northwestern pond turtles so that we could collect some data and pit tag them and um, put some notches on their shells and then re-release them. If we happen to catch sliders, um, we remove them from the system. Likewise, um, sometimes the best time to find turtles is in the nesting season. Um, and you're walking around, you might come across a, um, a red-eared slider on, on you know, the bank. And so when we do find one, we put them in a bucket and also remove them from the population. Um, but we're not, it's, uh, it was, it's a lot of work. It would be very expensive to really um, target just trapping red-eared sliders. So we're doing all these other work, you know, this, all this other work to give the Northwestern pond turtles an edge over the sliders. Great, and then, yeah, here's, um, cause we have a question about this. Here's Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's phone number. You can jot it down and make the call after this presentation or whenever you have the time, that would be greatly appreciated. I can also, send it out in the follow-up email that you all should get once the recording is posted. Going back to questions, um, I have one for you, Dr. Hapel. Um, it's where in, where in Oregon is the closest place to see a sea turtle? Yeah, in Oregon, you're gonna have a hard time seeing a sea turtle. <laughs> uh, they, as I said, they, they aren't, uh, they don't occur in our waters with the exception of leatherbacks and then these accidentals that come in uh, with the warmer temperatures. Uh, probably the best place, the closest place to Oregon, uh, if you can make it to Hawaii, the green turtles there uh, are, uh, you can actually snorkel with them. I mean, they're everywhere. <laughs> it's really exciting and a great place to see sea turtles. Uh, and then going south, uh, there are a fair number of loggerhead turtles, which are from Japan, that feed in the Baja area in Mexico. Uh, there are some green turtles in San Diego. Uh, they hang out at the uh, power plant there, which has warm water that goes into uh, San Diego Bay there. Um, and then uh, further south, as you get into Central America, that's where you find the uh, nesting populations of the olive ridley turtle uh, and uh, some of the other species. Yeah, I've seen, lucky enough to see the green turtles in Hawaii, definitely an amazing experience if anyone's able to make it out there. Um, it is a long flight though. Lori, could you talk a little bit about genetic isolation? Um, this person's heard that um, what's indicated in the past is when the Columbia and other rivers were allowed to flood, this maybe allowed turtles to migra migrate and exchange genetic material um, to sustain diversity. So in these isolated ponds, um, how far are they known to travel and is isolation a problem in your view? Um, I, yes, I, it is a problem. Um, I don't know how big of a problem it is or whether we've had that kind of genetic analysis done um, of turtle populations in Oregon. We certainly haven't had it done in um, at Golden Gardens or some of our other local sites. 
Um, however, that's um, habitat connectivity is something that we're always considering. Those of us that are kind of land managers um, and managing parkland and natural areas, we're always trying to think of connectivity. Um, that said, uh, the Northwestern pond turtle in particular can travel a long way on land. And so um, they may be moving around more than we think. They also move around a lot in the ponds. We notice them moving from one pond to another, and that we also find them in the channel um, nearby. So um, there aren't very many studies that have radio tagged Northwestern pond turtles. Um, it tends to be expensive and there's not a lot of funding for that type of work. So um, unless there's uh, somebody with a university who's willing to do that and, um, and it'd be wonderful to have more data on, on how far they can move and, you know, what are some things that we can improve on in terms of creating that habitat connectivity. And Lori, wouldn't you say that it would be, it's, it's tough if the ponds are isolated, then the turtles have to cross more roads to get between ponds. And I would think that roads would be really bad for turtles. Yep, absolutely. So for, for land-based or freshwater turtles, um, roadways are one, roads are one of the highest causes of mortality, especially for the females, because they're out actively looking for nests. So, um, Again, it was a lot of material to cover, but um, they, yeah, um, we love to build roads right along waterways or through waterways. Um, and so, or between, you know, ponds and, uh, you know, turtles, freshwater turtles did adapt to um, a lot of the backwater slough type habitat that um, we used to have more of when, when rivers were allowed to flow freely. And, um, and now we don't have those as much. And so um, a lot of those have become isolated ponds or um, we're filled in um, and we just have a lot more disruption of that connectivity. And this is just a great opportunity to put in a plug for RAWA, the Restoring mm -hmm. America's Wildlife Act, because uh, what that would do is bring a lot of money into the state uh, for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we already have all kinds of great plans of partnerships that we can do to do research on some of these species if we have those additional funds. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, just trying to get through as many questions as I can. So I might ask just a few more if that's okay. Um, this person's wondering if you could show us the slide of the geographical distribution of the freshwater turtles in Oregon again. Um, and while you pull that up, I can ask you, Dr. Hapel, one more question. Um, and that is, how often are sea turtles that wash up on Oregon beaches successfully rehabilitated? Yeah, I actually looked that up um, and didn't uh, find uh, kind of a, a multi-year estimate of that, but um, generally speaking, if we can get to them soon enough, so they haven't been hurt, harmed too much rolling around in the waves and, and we can actually warm them up gradually, uh, they do pretty well. Uh, and they can actually be rehabilitated quite nicely. Um, recent, uh, recent year, there were three that were uh, washed up in one year and two out of three made it. So varies a lot depends on uh, what condition they are when we find them but the sooner that we hear about them the more likely it is that we can get out there and pick one up and get it uh, rehabilitated don't pick it up yourself though <laughs> <laughs> call the aquarium <laughs> all right yes yeah, so make sure to call the aquarium if you are seeing a one of our rare sea turtles um one last question for you uh, could, could i ask you a question was it the pond turtle uh range they wanted to see or the painted or both um they just said the geographical distribution of the freshwater turtles in oregon okay so i think so, in general so here's the pond turtle can you see that is that on the screen um i'm just seeing the western pond turtle range okay yeah. and then the painted and there's the painted okay Right. And then one last question for you, Lori. Um, 
Do you think beavers at all can help with native turtle habitat? Is that something you've studied or come across at all? Was that beavers? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think they're um, co-evolved. Um, has anybody ever seen those stickers that say salmon equal or beavers equal salmon? Um, I found one one years ago and I wrote down it equals turtles. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yes, absolutely. They, um, the turtles love the backwater habitat that's created by beavers. Um, you know, those backwater habitats support all sorts of, uh, invertebrates, um, you know, that aquatic vegetation I was talking about, they're often, um, it causes flooding um, of areas that then um, have a lot of structure, that woody structure that the juveniles like. So, so yeah, they're, they're co-evolved and um, we actually love having beavers. Even in our urban area of Eugene, um, we generally uh, welcome them and believe they're supporting all sorts of other species like the, the pond and painted turtles. Great, thank you both so much. Um, and yeah, to anyone in the audience still hanging around, um, make sure to follow up with those links that I'll send on the email as well as the phone number and uh, give a call about Rawa as soon as you can to make sure that this important bill passes. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you again to our wonderful presenters and have a good night, everyone. <laughs>